Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, today we're gonna be hearing about Marine Monitor M2, understanding and tracking human activity in nearshore and coastal environments. Um, we're very pleased today to have Sam King and Brendan Tuffer here. Uh, they are with the Protected Seas Marine Monitor. Um, we're very pleased they were willing to come and talk to us today about M2. And uh, we've been reading a lot about M2 and its work in our EBM help and MPA help listservs. And so um, we were very keen to learn more about how it works. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know how the webinar will run. We'll have a presentation largely from Sam um, initially, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Brendan may be answering some questions in the chat and in the Q&A panel uh, while Sam is presenting, and then we'll have the Q&A and we'll have both Sam and Brendan answering questions. Um, you can send in questions throughout the webinar. They can go to the Q&A panel and the chat. Um, it's a little bit easier for us to moderate an answer in the Q&A, uh, but the chat does have the advantage that you can, make your pres uh, you can make your question either just send it to us or you can send it to everyone. So it, um, if you wanted to get input from others on the webinar, just to put it in the chat and make sure it's visible to everyone. You can also reply to questions um, and send in fee feedback and other experiences that you wanna share um, in the chat by sending to everyone. We just ask that you keep it on topic and professional. Um, so I will turn it over to Sam now. We, Sam, we really appreciate you being here today. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting us to, uh, thanks for hosting the webinar. Um, we've been really excited to share it with the community. Um, and thank you all uh, for joining today. So I'll be speaking about the Marine Monitor, what we call M2 for short. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about how the system works and then also how our partners are using the technology to understand and track human activity in nearshore coastal environments. So M2 is a vessel monitoring platform, essentially, both the physical system and the software. It uses radar, a camera, and other sensors to monitor nearby vessel activity from shore. And it collects data fully autonomously and continuously 24 seven. It's really ideal for monitoring near shore managed areas, and it can be especially useful for monitoring remote areas. Um, in this image here, you can see all those M2 components I mentioned, the radar and the camera and a few other sensors uh, fully integrated in this off-grid system. And then this system is actually monitoring a pretty remote area of the California coast. So there are a number of technologies out there today being used to monitor vessel activity on the water. And these range from you know, very simple cameras on one end, all the way to pretty advanced um, and sometimes pretty expensive satellite monitoring. Each have their benefits and limitations. M2 primarily uses coastal radar, which kind of sits right in the middle of the cost um, and, the, and the tracking range. Um, it also offers really high resolution data on activity and it's pretty approachable technology. It uses the exact same radar system that you would buy if you had a boat and you needed to, to navigate on the water. So um, like I mentioned in the first slide, we also integrate a camera in addition to the radar, and we also include AIS as well. So if you're not familiar with AIS, um, that stands for the Automatic Identification System. And this is a traditional tracking system used by larger and commercial vessels. And it's 
primarily for safety and it is required for these larger vessels. Um, but it does not apply to smaller vessels um, like recreational or maybe small scale fishing boats. And that's really where the radar and the camera come in. So before we get into you know, the, the details about this system, I just wanted to start off by showing some data from um, one of our longest continuously operating sites. So this is located on Harrow Strait in the boundary waters on the border of Washington State in the US and British Columbia in Canada. Now, from this site, like I mentioned, M2 is collecting AIS data. And so if we only looked at that traditional tracking data, mostly of larger vessels, we would see that coming by the system, about 30 vessels a day. And then, you know, maybe some, some interesting temporal patterns. We kind of see maybe a little bit of bump in activity each year. Um, but then if we add the data that's collected by radar, we really see how much is missing if you were only to look at AIS. In fact, you would miss about 60% of the activity coming by this area. And then also some significant, potentially uh, interesting patterns. When we look at the radar information, we see that these vessels, these smaller vessels really stick to kind of the, the seasonal trends. So there's a clear need to monitor vessels using other technologies besides just traditional AIS. We chose to integrate radar into M2 because it's an established technology, it's reliable, it's widely available, and it's also familiar to, to mariners who, who might be used to being out on the water. So just a few more um, details about the actual system components. Marine radar tracks all vessels from ships all the way down to kayaks, and there's no participation required. And it's not required that the vessels um, have anything on board to track them. The radar does it all itself. So it's ideal for tracking these smaller vessels out to about five nautical miles from the system, and that's around 10 kilometers. And radar typically tracks weather or tracks vessels in all weather conditions, in fog, it obviously tracks during the day, but then it's especially helpful at night when cameras or other technologies might not be able to get a visual on the boat on the water. And it does this with high resolution. It provides vessel location and speed, and we get a data point about every few seconds. Now, since the radar doesn't provide any information on the vessel's identity, it just gives us a geolocation and a speed, um, we have a camera that is automatically directed to those vessel positions on the water. And so it will pan and then zoom and collect images of those boats. As I mentioned, we do integrate AIS and AIS provides a huge suite of information on these vessels, including what type of vessel it is, what the identity is, where it's going, time of arrival, all of this really helpful information. Um, but what's also really useful with M2 is that you can use AIS and radar to identify any vessels that aren't participating in the tracking technology. So you can look at um, radar and AIS at the same time and be able to see those vessels um, that are operating without AIS. And so this is an example of that. So just to orient you, this is a map showing the M2 site at that Harrow Strait location. And so the M2 system, the radar and the camera are both located in the top right corner of the map where you see the M2 logo. And then you can see the red radar imagery. So we're using traditional marine radar. So however familiar you are, familiar you are with radar, you probably have seen some sort of, you know, radar screen um, with that red imagery. And so that's what we're also seeing. And so the imagery, you can see solid objects. You can see a marker on the water, you can see islands, um, and then you can also see vessels. So this purple track line that's kind of coming down um, from the north, 
that is a large cargo ship that was tracked by both radar and AIS. And so you can see this is the image that M2 collected of the vessel. And then you can see there's a radar target. And then there's also, you can see the name of the vessel there. So we're also getting AIS data as well. Same is true for that vessel just to the right. Um, but then if you look up in the top right corner to the orange track line, that track was, or that vessel was only tracked by radar. You can kind of see the little radar signature underneath the yellow arrow, um, but the image that M2 got shows that it was a recreational vessel. And in fact, these vessels aren't required to broadcast AIS and most of them don't. So we only track that by radar. So M2 is used by different groups and organizations, government agencies, MPA managers, enforcement personnel, but also NGOs and research institutions that are you know, just interested in measuring human activity in these marine spaces and looking at potential impacts on those marine ecosystems. So um, this system shown here is located in Baja, California, Sur, Mexico. And our NGO partners there work with federal and local enforcement agencies um, to share data across groups and be able to get the data to anybody who needs it. So right now, active um, in the world, we have almost 30 systems right now in 10 countries. We've, we've also deployed um, many more over the years that, that aren't active right now. If you're looking at the map, you can see a significant concentration um, on the west coast of California. We are based in Cal or the west coast of the US. Um, we're based in California and that's um, where we deployed a lot of our first systems, these systems are still online today. Um, so that's why you'll see a lot in that area. But we've also uh, really, really expanded. And especially in the, in the pandemic, our team got really adept at figuring out how to deploy all these technology components to, to, to the world and also to really remote places. Now, before, um, up until this slide, I've only really been showing our, our most kind of uh, advanced system, that off-grid mobile marine monitor. But I just wanted to touch on the fact that sometimes that isn't always necessary. <clears throat> the basics of the, system, of the system are really just the radar and the camera, and then the control center where all of the computing and the networking happens. And then that just sends data to the live M2 viewer where anyone with an internet connection can log into your browser and see live data and also review historical data as well. So this site here that you're seeing, this radar and camera are simply mounted on the roof of a marine safety center along the coast. The networking, the M2 control center, the box sits right nearby on the roof and then data are immediately streamed live to the cloud. So the radar works the same way that you would use it on your boat. You're navigating around the water. You could look at your radar screen and be able to see where the solid objects are around you. In M2's case, we use the exact same technology, but the radar antenna is located on land. And so the radar system identifies vessel positions in the radar imagery out on the water. And then M2 software tracks those positions to identify activity over time. So you can kind of see the full playback of where that vessel, where it came from, and then also what its activity looked like while it was hanging out in the area. Now the range of radar is essentially line of sight. The smallest vessels are typically tracked out to five nautical miles, like I mentioned before, about 10 kilometers. And that's a limitation of the size of the boat and also just, just radar itself. If the vessels are a little bit larger or even the largest vessels can be tracked all the way out to about 24 nautical miles, a little under 50 kilometers away. 
And I want to show some examples of the photos that M2 gets. The range of the camera can really vary based on the configuration of the location where the camera is compared to the water. But generally, within about one mile, you can identify the specific vessel. So in this image all the way on the left, you can see the identifying numbers on the side of the boat. As we go out a little bit farther, around three nautical miles, you can usually identify the vessel type. And then at what we kind of consider is the maximum range at about five miles, you can at least confirm that a vessel is there. Radar, like I mentioned previously, gives you a location, but the camera can really help confirm that there's somebody out there where the radar says there is. And we, this isn't, we're not um, limited, or I should say we are limited by the camera that we use, but we can also integrate other more higher power zoom cameras to be able to extend this range. Those cameras just get more expensive pretty quickly. So all of these data are integrated into the M2 viewer. And users can also sign up for notifications here where they can receive text or email alerts to let them know in real time that there's su suspicious activity happening in these areas that they've defined. So this example here is an MPA that protects a multi-species spawning aggregation site. And in this case, you're not allowed to fish in this area. Rangers will get a notification that a vessel is hanging out in the area, like this example that I've shown. So they get a notification and they log into the viewer. They can review all of the photos. They can see the track line and the live location. And then they can decide how they want to respond. So M2 was originally designed kind of with this um, protocol in mind. It was specifically designed as a tool for MPA enforcement to be able to help rangers monitor areas without necessarily having to be out on the water 24 seven to intercept potential offenders. So I'm gonna show and talk about in detail some examples of M2 being used for enforcement but then over the years, we've seen the data just really being used in different ways and some really interesting ways. And so I do want to touch on those different applications um, after that. So this, what you're seeing here, is the first M2 system that was deployed to Belize in partnership with Ternethetol Sustainability Association. And as you can see, it's located on a pretty remote atoll uninhabited uh, off the mainland of Belize. So even though the area is relatively remote, there's a pretty extensive MPA network that surrounds the atoll. And so some zones might um, prohibit fishing, some zones might allow fishing, some zones might allow scuba diving, others might not. And so <clears throat> there's a concern about keeping making sure that folks are doing what they're supposed to be doing within those different zones with different designations. And then put on top of that, there's increasing tourism and increasing development on the atoll. And again, remote location, some rangers are on the mainland and then some might actually be posted at the atoll. And so it's really helpful to be able to have access to data from both of those locations at the same time. And so M2 provides monitoring for smaller vessels that are there, you know, more traditional boats that are used for fishing. So the radar is going to pick those up, um, which would normally be absent in most other tracking technologies that are out there. Like I mentioned, the rangers can react in real time. And so they get a notification, they notice in the viewer that there's activity happening. Then they can, they can log in, see the actual live photos of the vessel and then be able to say, okay, this is a dive boat. They might actually be allowed to be here versus they're fishing. Maybe we should go out on the water and respond. And then they also use the system, the um, M2 reporting to be able to 
plan their patrols, think about how many visitors are coming to the MPA every year, every month, every day, and then picking out those times of heightened activity or maybe areas of heightened activity to really focus their, their efforts when they're physically on the water. And they've had a lot of success monitoring a, a pretty large area in a pretty remote place. So moving to the next example in Southern California, we have a number of systems there with our longtime partners, Wild Coast. So something similar to Belize, some things completely different um, in these Southern California sites. So here, recreational fishing is very uh, popular. It's a really highly urbanized location with a lot of people right on the coast. And so it's pretty easy. You have a boat, jump in your boat, um, head out and do some fishing or some recreating, something like that. And so a lot of the vessels in this area look like the one in the image here in the middle. Um, and these vessels you know, wouldn't necessarily be tracked by AIS. So the radar is really important in this context. Similar to Belize, in California, there's a pretty extensive network of MPAs. And so our partners are always interested in how human activity is comparing to these MPAs. Is illegal activity happening inside? How much poaching is happening? Where's the activity spatially compared to the boundaries of the MPA? And all these really interesting questions that they can start to get at with all of this data on, on all vessels in the area. And so our partners also support enforcement with data here. They document and share, create kind of personal partner reports for enforcement so that we can really kind of communicate what the system is, is seeing and why it's important. And then the integration of radar and AIS is also really important here. I was just alluding to it, but in an urban place, it might seem like a lot of vessels are maybe participating in AIS or or being tracked, but we found that it's really not the case. And a lot of these smaller recreational vessels essentially you know, are going untracked, even though they are subject to a lot of the same rules and regulations that larger boats might be subject to in these MPAs. And so what's really interesting at this site, um, or I should say it with these group of sites, is that the data from M2 have been used in two formal legal proceedings. M2 data provided really high resolution information, the photos, um, GPS points compared to where these MPAs were when MPA offenses were happening inside the boundaries. And then ultimately both of the cases resulted in successful prosecutions, thanks to in part the, the really high resolution data that M2 provided supplementing the case. So M2 is also really commonly used in the context of science and conservation. Um, like I was mentioning before, data are being used in California to look at human activity, to in, inform potential policy changes as, um, as partners are starting to think about potential changes to that MPA network. And radar is also an excellent tool for monitoring speed limits when they're in place. So this system deployed here um, is just outside San Francisco Bay, monitoring the area just beyond the Golden Gate Bridge. It's used by the Marine Mammal Center to conduct risk assessments for the large whale species that have been hanging out in the area more often recently. So in this area, you know, ships are asked to slow down to avoid collisions. Um, and so the data from this system can be used to kind of evaluate what that's looking like in reality and see where, where whales might be most at risk. Um, a similar system is used on the east coast of the US to monitor vessel speeds in North Atlantic right whale speed management zones. So the North Atlantic right whale population is highly endangered and threatened by ship strikes. And so the radar technology combined with the camera can identify vessels that might be speeding beyond these speed limits that are in place um, and then 
be able to identify what boats those are. And so if those boats are small enough where they don't participate in any tracking technology like AIS, radar might be the only way to be able to get at that in real time with high resolution and, and speed information. This system here is located in the Sabu Sea region of Indonesia, and it deters poachers from local fishing grounds that you can see here, and also monitors the area around sea turtle nesting that happens on shore that's really biologically important in this area. And finally, M2 is a great tool for marine safety as well. It's really just another pair of eyes on the water 24 seven. This system is located in American Samoa and was used during the pandemic to watch out for unauthorized vessels that were coming onto the mainland, main island, um, when restrictions for that were in place. So there are two primary pathways for acquiring an M2 system direct purchase, but I also wanted to talk on grant opportunities as well. So this can be the case if there are MPAs in place somewhere, but maybe there are limited financial resources for protecting, for monitoring, enforcing the regulations of those MPAs. We completely understand that the cost of tech may be prohibitive to some users in, in this field, but as an organization, we're focused on marine conservation. And so we frequently work with partners to help identify resources that can maybe be put together to help support deployments. And our team is there to provide support along the way. We typically help users identify suitable sites and choose the system components that will meet their monitoring needs. So this location right here, pretty remote. And so that M3, the mobile marine monitor trailer is necessary to be able to get power and internet to this location. But you know, if there's a ranger station, um, anything like that, that has power, it can get, it only gets simpler from there. Um, as I showed the example earlier, if there's some sort of, there's power and internet in place, the components that you need can actually be pretty minimal. And so when we work with potential partners, <clears throat> we work with them to really kind of figure out exactly what they need and then what we can offer that's going to meet those needs. So, and even though we've built these systems to be fully autonomous and as easy to operate as possible, um, it's technology, things happen. So we're also there to support our users <clears throat> throughout the deployments as well. So in the field of vessel monitoring, with many tools available, the benefits that M2 brings are 24 seven high resolution data collection, integration of small vessel information. And again, the camera is really important for identifying those vessels that are tracked by radar. M2 has also been in use in the field since 2015 and it uses reliable, familiar technologies, and then can also use these technologies to monitor remote coastal areas, to really expand the footprint of monitoring and enforcement. And as other technologies progress, we are always working to integrate them with M2 when we can. So ultimately M2 is really a platform for collaboration and partnerships. There is a lot more information than what I've shared on our website. So I really want to encourage everyone to check out m2marinemonitor.com. You can see a lot more about system details. You can see what all of our partners are up to and what they're doing around the world. So be sure and check that out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you so much, Brendan, for all the question answering in the chat and the Q&A so far. Um, this was fantastic, a great overview. Um, I'd remind everyone you can send in questions to the Q&A um, um, panel, or you can put them in the chat and um, send them either just to host and panelists or make them visible to everyone. So we'll go with some uh, questions that we still have outstanding. 
Um, there's several questions uh, about cost. One um, I'll read, and I think you answered some of the later questions in this. Uh, what are the cost ranges, guarantees, user support, power options, apart from the solar array? And, and I think you answered some of those aspects, but um, there was then another question about cost. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, was what are the cost implications of purchasing the entire setup? And then there was another cost question of what is the cost of a trailered system? So I guess any numbers or ranges you could give would be helpful. Sure. Brendan, do you want to take that? Yeah, or you can, you can also go to the next slide if you want. Um, yeah, this is a question that we uh, always get. Um, and we kind of, I think we prepared a slide with some numbers on it. Um, maybe. There it is. That's oh, hidden. Um, well, yeah, we didn't want to include it in the actual presentation, but uh, we had it in our back pocket just in case. So, yeah. Um, generally speaking, the, these are the costs that you're expected to incur to deploy a system. Um, as Sam mentioned, we have kind of two variations of our system. One is the core marine monitor system, um, which is all of our networking communications, rem remote control uh, of the camera, radar, AIS, and weather sensors. Um, and that's around 110,000 US dollars. And then the mobile units are around $190,000 uh, US. Um, and that, that incorporates everything that you see from the marine monitor system, but also uh, with the telescoping mast and then that off-grid power system, um, remote, remote communication and support. Um, these systems have been designed to be as easily deployed as possible um, because we have a really, uh, wide range of users from, you know, very uh, simple setups in tropical places to um, uh, federal government agencies that are using our systems. So um, what we've done is design a system that's just very easy to use and set up and deploy. So the M2 system, it just requires power. And we're, we're talking about 180 watts for those that are more interested in the actual power budget. So it's, it's not that um, energy um, this is not that high of an energy requirement um, and can be plugged into an outlet in a building, um, in an office, at a house, um, and operate um, from there. We've deployed these M2 systems in just a few hours. So we, were, we had, you know, a, a data poor environment where we were collecting data. And within a few hours, we were collecting, uh, you know, vessel information about that area. Uh, similarly, the M3 systems can be deployed really rapidly once they're in place. Um, with one or two people, you can deploy those systems in a couple hours as well. Um, but there's obviously a little bit more involved uh, with the, 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 the setup and breakdown of those units if you're, if you're moving them. Um, so hopefully, I, I think I answered most of those that question or those questions. Thank you. And um, if there were any specifics, anybody want to go ahead and just um, put that in the, the chat or the Q and A, and we can follow up. <clears throat> uh, we have a number of other questions. Let's see. There was a, a one, hi, very interesting systems. Would there be any issues with the implementation of these systems in a mosaic-like archipelago setting with hundreds of smaller islands, line of sight or such? I understand that this might be a problem for cameras. Um, for instance, if trees on the islands limit the sight in certain spots, but would the radar be affected? Um, that's a great question. Um, that kind of describes a lot of the locations where we have deployed these systems. Um, so yeah, it line of sight is a great way to think about it. Um, the, the camera is typically deployed. Um, so actually in this, the screen that's, that's still, the slide that's still up, the camera is right next to the radar in, in most cases. Um, so if the radar can see an area, um, the camera is also going to have a, you know, a clear, a clear site to that location on the water. Um, we also have the ability to have the camera and the radar not be at the same location. Um, and so if, you know, there's a big tower somewhere with the radar on top of it, the camera could potentially be on shore or, or somewhere else as long as it's connected into our network. Um, if, if there's some sort of mis mismatch, like you mentioned about, what the radar is able to see versus um, where 
images are, are really important. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that um, it is something that we always think about and we do part of the process of um, talking about a potential site is starting to estimate what view sheds would look like. Um, and we have a we have a model to do that. Um, and so we would never we would never let anyone deploy a site into a place where we weren't confident that they were going to get good data. Um, and so sometimes that means you know moving a hundred meters down down the beach or maybe getting a little bit higher elevation. Um, so we we do work with partners when you're interested to be able to to hopefully come up with solutions to overcome any of those barriers. Okay, thank you guys. Okay. Let's see. Um, another question that came in: Can you use the trailered system to monitor a couple different sites? For instance, seasonal monitoring in different locations. For sure. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I'm making sure that I understand the question. Um, so, being able to move the system. Um, I think that, is, that is the question. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, and that's the complete um, theory behind the mobile marine monitor. Um, I didn't mention it, but the the North Atlantic right whale on the east coast of the US, that's a really highly migratory species. So they're moving up and down the coast every year. And so the mobile system that monitors ship speeds um, on the US east coast moves to be able to, to follow that migration. And so that's, these trailers can be hooked up on the back of a pickup truck. Um, as long as there's a hitch, it's, it is pretty easy to move these and to relo relocate them, um, you know, however often users would need to adjust to changing concerns, changing areas and seasons, things like that. Brendan, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Nope, I think that's a really good example. and. Um specifically not use case and, and uh, application. Um, kind of similarly, there was a question about can an MG system be sent to, for example, Tanzania and be set up with folks there or does it require MG staff? Um, so we actually, we, what we, what we do is we do a system burn in in California or in the US before we ship our units to make sure that everything is working properly. Um, and we configure everything before it's even, it's sent. So that when it gets to the location, it's really a matter of um, putting, setting up the antenna and the camera and then um, plugging in the, the M2 control center and getting internet access. So power internet, and then we actually have the ability to um, calibrate all of these sensors and manage the system remotely so that it can um, be put in use really quickly. Um, and we've actually done that for years all around the world. So um, Malaysia, for instance, we, we have a system in an archipelago that, that uh, um, has you know several different islands to that example as well. Um, but we've never set foot on this island and, and deployed with with uh, personnel in, in, in uh, Malaysia to deploy that unit. Um, we've also done that in several other countries. Um, we ship our units uh, via ocean freight, specifically the M3 systems, and we've shipped those to American Samoa, uh, Indonesia, Ecuador, uh, and then uh, just south of us, or south of where I am in, in California to the Baja Peninsula. Um, but we're also able to ship units uh, via air freight, which um, is surprisingly cost competitive sometimes with uh, ocean freight, and it, it can be much more rapidly um, sent to a location and then deployed. Obviously not the M3 system, but the M2 system, the core system um, can be shipped uh, via, via the air, air, airplane or air freight. Hey, that's super useful to know. Uh, thank you guys. Um, this is a really interesting question. Are there plans to develop capabilities for mounting these systems onto buoys or other offshore platforms? So I'll, I'll field that one again, Sam. The, the biggest limitation for us is the power budget. So while 180 watts of continuous power isn't significantly, isn't that much of a power drop from a shore-based system um, with uh, grid power, that, that is a, a higher energy budget for a buoyed system. So um, what, I mean, we're always um, iterating our design and making it um, smaller, lighter, cheaper, um, 
and, and require less power um, so that we could move towards that application. Um, and there is a potential that we could do that, uh, but it would, it would take some more development on our, on our end. And also just the, the difficulty of managing a buoy deployed system would require a, like, you know, a, a good partner that's has the capability and capacity to support that, the hardware on that type of um, application. Okay, thank you, Brendan. Um, and thank you to Arusa who's been waiting patiently for answering that question. Can, this question, um, can you, can the device withstand temperatures for the Arctic Ocean? Uh, I'll also answer that one. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I actually flagged that as a question I wanted to answer verbally because um, part of what we do um, as Marine Monitor is we work very closely with our partners and customers and the the people that are deploying the systems and managing the systems to build a system that's suitable for their location. So um, we have, you know, our core system and we know what it takes to, to get our system in, you know, 90% of the places and, and our current configuration would, will do that. But for applications like the Arctic, for instance, we can make modifications to our system. We can change the, the hardware and ensure that it's, it's, it's built to withstand that type of environment. Um, similarly, um, being, you know, deployed to Saudi Arabia in 130 degree temperatures, like there's things that we can do to um, spec the system out to uh, operate in that type of environment. Um, it just would, honestly, at the end of the day, it would just require more power um, because you need air conditioners and you need heaters and um, things like that. So um, certainly possible. And, and um, what I did want to highlight is that we, have our core system, but we are able to customize and, and, and change our system to meet the needs of the end user to ensure that the, the system and the hardware is, is appropriate for their environment. Okay, great. Thank you, Brandon. Um, another question that came in earlier in the presentation, um, please explain a little how these data sets could be deployed to support marine spatial planning and sustainable ocean management. For sure, yeah. Um, so kind of in this vessel activity monitoring world, um, we've come across a lot of folks who are familiar with AIS and VMS. And so these are you know, tracking systems that provide lat long locations, speeds, information on vessel identity. So ways to reconstruct activity activity over time in a scientific way. Um, and so this has been done over and over and over again in different analyses, looking at different applications. Um, and so when the system was, when M2 was designed and we were starting to think about data flow and what the data looked like, it's really modeled af after those data sources. So we, from the radar system, we're getting a lot of the same information that's provided by VMS or AIS. So we're getting those lat long positions, we're getting course and speed. And so these are just data points that you, know, you can put on a map, you can analyze, you can look at temporal patterns over time. Um, and so in that way, it's pretty integratable with these more traditional systems that have provided data like this in the past. And, and, and obviously we'll continue to provide really valuable information in the future. Um, but the data that the radar gets paired with the camera is really meant to, to mirror that same data so that you can do the same type of analysis. So you could, you could plan, um, you could look at trends over time, trends over space, different vessel types, different types of activities, um, how activity compares to MPA boundaries, things like that. Um, you could do that for the radar in either just with radar, you could combine that with AIS or VMS. Um, and we do actually combine AIS and radar within the M2 system. But because the data is kind of designed in this agnostic way, it's really easy for, for outside data to be kind of integrated or compared with M2 data as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Um, okay, another question that came in, um, with such frequent data points across multiple systems, do you run into any issues with data storage and or archiving? 
That is a great question and always uh, at top of mind for our team. Um, like I said, we get a data point from every active system about every two seconds. So that piles up uh, in addition to photos, um, all the data that we're getting. Um, so we securely encrypt our data um, with Amazon Web Services, which is um, pretty, pretty standard use um, uh, by, by a lot of different um, groups, organizations. Um, and so that's where the data is actually stored um, for most of our systems. And actually, um, we can, they provide a lot of help as far as monitoring how much data you're using. Can you use the data more efficiently? Can you store it more efficiently? Um, things like that. Um, and then we're always keeping an eye on, you know, every, every new system that goes live, there's more more data flow. And so that's just something that we manage on our end to make sure that our databases um, and our servers can handle um, what's coming in and then also just anticipating what's going to happen in the future as we as we add more and more. OK, thank you, Sam. Um, started to address this a little, Brendan, in another uh, another um, answer to another question, but uh, a question that came in, how much detailed information can be obtained for large migratory marine mammals? I, I think the question is the, the physical presence of uh, large migratory marine mammals. Yes, that's that what right? I'm taking it to be, yeah. Yeah, the, so I, I actually just answered this uh, or a similar question in the chat as well. So the, our system, it, it uses a, uh, a radar uses an electromagnetic pulse, so that that pulses the signal out, and so it reflects off of anything that's on the water, and that's how we acquire a target and then track the target. Um, the problem with whales is that their presence at the surface is usually limited, and so um, we don't have enough to process the the acquisition of the whale and then to start tracking it. Um, it's not enough. Sorry, it's not long enough for our system to be able to track the whale, um, the whales in in real time or actually at all for that matter. Um, so we are unable to actually track the whales themselves. We are, we are more tracking the vessels that are in and around uh, or near the, the, the whales um, to ensure that they're following regulations that are in place. Um, we have, you know, the one thing about our system is that we you do have the ability to take control of the camera, for instance. So remotely you could, um, at, anyone with, you know, that's managing a system or has a, permission to, to be on a system can log in and, and remotely um, control everything that is at the physical deployment location. Um, and so what we found is the camera is actually one of the things that is is most interesting for people to take control of. So the reason why I highlight this is because if, if there is a, like a, a, some migratory whales coming through an area or, or um, the presence of worlds are known, it's possible for the user to take control and, and actually um, monitor the area in real time with the M2, with the camera system. Um, and then we are, you know, we're always interested in, you know, potential other sensors that could be used to actually track whales and integrate that into our system as well. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's different developments that are taking place in, in, in that, in that regards um, as we speak. So we're always open to that type of uh, collaboration as well. Thank you, Brendan. Okay, another question. Let's see. Do you see the possibilities to employ these systems in the high seas? What technical challenges do you see here? That's a great question. Um, we, because we are um, right now, we base our system on land. Um, it's not something that we've put a lot of um, development into yet um, because we're really trying to fill the niche of the near shore area. Um, you know, there's so many great technologies coming online related to satellites that can monitor these really remote, very remote, not even near land, high seas areas um, that, you know, our system isn't set up right now to, to do that. Um, those systems also aren't great at being able to get really high resolution data at the coastline. Um, you know, if they're, if they're only coming back a few times a day, you only get a few data points of the vessel, um, as well as small vessels in the imagery. 
satellite technology is obviously going to progress quickly. Um, but M2 is really meant to fill, to fill that niche monitoring the coastal area. And that being said, you know, if, as Brendan kind of uh, just mentioned, we are always open and have had a lot of partnerships through the years. So if, you know, we could partner with somewhere, someone that has a satellite sensor or something like that, a group or organization where we can really fuse the data together to be able to fill the gap of the high seas and then also this, this really high resolution coastal area. Um, so it's on our minds, um, but we haven't done it yet. Okay, great, Sam. Um, I'd let everyone know we don't have any questions right now. We've done a great job of answering all the questions or well, I have, Sam and Brendan have um, through both typing in the Q&A and the chat and um, out loud. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and send them in now because we do have some more time. Oh, we do have one, let's see. Hi, have you come across any regulatory or legal challenges in installing the system at a site? Brendan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I, to, today we have not. Um, and I think that goes back to our, I guess, commitment and involve, in involvement in the deployment process with the partner on the ground that's going to be deploying the system to ensure that there aren't any um, potential uh, issues with the deployment of the system uh, at a location. Um, Shore-based radar systems in general is kind of a gray area um, because it is managed by the FCC, um, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and uh, there are you need to have a, you know um, certain permissions um, legally, but it's still kind of a a gray area in terms of regulations, at least in the U.S. Um, and in other places in the world. Um, but again, yeah, we work really close with our partners to make sure that we are meeting the requirements uh, for that specific location and ensuring there aren't any um, potential issues with, with the deployment of a, a shore based radar system. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Brendan. Um, and we do not have any more questions at this time. So I guess we'll wrap up unless we see any come in. Um, this was fantastic. It was great to, um, the, the presentation was fantastic and especially kudos, your, your graphics were really, uh, really, yeah, uh, very informative. Um, and, um, the, everything was very clear and the great job answering questions. Um, we look forward to hearing how things move forward in the next few years and about new installations. Um, and yeah, we appreciate you being here today. Oh, there is a question that just came in. Let's see. How does the fellowship grant application work? Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in the fellowship grant opportunity, um, feel free to email us at mtu.protectancies.net um, and then we can start that conversation. Uh, there's an application process and um, just to kind of verify it's a suitable site. And then we, we go from there to figure out how we might be able to help um, allocate resources to that deployment location. Okay. And, and I think Thank just, and, and just generally speaking, if, if, if any questions are outstanding or um, something wasn't clear in today's presentation, um, please feel free to email us at m2apprenticeseeds.net. That goes to our whole team. Um, we're a small team, but we're, at, we're very responsive. And um, we, uh, um, yeah, we look forward to, to collaborating and, and working with some of you. Um, and, and don't hesitate to, to share any questions you may have. Yes, and I can vouch that they're very responsive and it's much appreciated. Um, and just to let everyone know this webinar was recorded. The webinar will be the recording will be posted at www.octogroup.org slash webinars. Um, and you can share that with any colleagues you think might be interested. Um, and there they will also share the, the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation and that'll be posted alongside the recordings um, on that page. So again, thank you so much, Sam and Brendan. We really appreciate you being here and good luck with all your future deployments. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Yes, same. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you on future webinars.